I'm Dr. Stephen Lemon, and this is my lecture on Avastin and metastatic breast cancer, given at the Methodist Esterbrook Cancer Center Symposium on Women's Cancers from last fall. Steve Lemon is one of our medical oncologists. He's with Oncology Associates here at the Cancer Center. He did his internal medicine training at Michigan State University. Uh, he did his cancer fellowship at the uh, National Cancer Institute. He has a master's in public health from Johns Hopkins Institution. My talk uh, today, anti-angiogenic treatment of breast cancer. This is Donna, and Donna uh, was one of my patients. And she was diagnosed with breast cancer in 1999 at age 68. Uh, this was uh, stage two cancer. It was um, lymph node negative and uh, est estrogen negative, progesterone positive, HER2 protein positive, and she underwent a mastectomy and axillary dissection. She um, developed metastatic disease and then died uh, just earlier this year at age 80 from her metastatic breast cancer. Um, and what some of us are doing and some experts are doing now is kind of changing a little bit of what our goal is uh, in cancer treatment. And so rather than curing all cancer, we are realizing that there is room for trying to prevent cancer death. So a person might develop cancer, but we're trying to prevent them from dying from it. Um, and to do that, we need to learn more about what cancer uh, does, how it spreads, how it responds. And so you're seeing a lot of talk about personalized therapy, about targeted therapies, and uh, anti-angiogenesis is one of those types of therapies. Now this is the plot for Donna's treatment. And um, what this chart shows is that um, you have the year that she lived with breast cancer for 12 years here. And then the plot is all the different treatments she had. So on the right are all the different treatments and then those colors correspond on the bar graph of when she had those treatments. And it's not really important what treatments she had. What I'm trying to show you is just a sense of how her life was with breast cancer. So she was diagnosed and she got adjuvant treatment um, initially here, the adriamycin and cytoxan chemotherapy, and then that was followed by about four years of tamoxifen, so an anti-estrogen anti treatment. Right at about that four-year mark, she was found to have metastatic disease to the liver, and that was confirmed by a biopsy. So she was in her early 70s at that time, uh, metastatic disease to the liver. You might say, well, that's not a very good prognosis. And, and how many of us are asked if someone gets diagnosed with metastatic cancer, you know, what, what's one of the first questions people ask us? How long do I have, Doc? You know, well, what do you tell them? Uh, you know, I'm not sure what do you tell them, because they don't want to hear that they don't have very long. And the average length of survival is about two years after metastatic breast cancer. That doesn't sound like a very long time to most people. So I don't know how long they have, but the idea is hopefully as long as possible with as best quality of life as possible. So Donna, in her 70s, she lived for almost eight years with metastatic breast cancer in the liver. Eight years, and she had a pretty good quality of life. Her husband was still alive. She had a lot of different treatments, you know, so we kind of went from one treatment to one treatment. As new drugs became available, we looked at those, Herceptin, Avastin. And early on in her metastatic disease, treatments lasted for a fair amount of time, six months, maybe a couple years. Towards the end of her life, then, the treatments did not last as long and she had more, and ultimately um, we weren't able to go any longer. But she had a good quality of life with breast cancer treatment for about, you know, most of her 70s. So I think that that was a, val that's, it was a valuable effort that we did. So I want to talk about Avastin, or Bevacizumab, which is an anti-angiogenic inhibitor that um, we use in breast cancer now, and primarily in metastatic breast cancer. Now, we, we know that it's, tumors need to have a blood supply. So 
um, to get a blood supply, blood vessels have to be developed. And there's different ways that tumors make that happen. Um, so that's what Avastin targets, and I'm going to go in a little bit more detail. Now, I want to carry on the history of medicine here this morning. So this is Dr. Folkman, and uh, he was very important in anti-angiogenesis development, and he lived from 1933 to 2008. He was born in Ohio, the son of a rabbi, and he often accompanied his father to the hospital on patient visits. He's a trained pediatric surgeon on the East Coast, and he had to do his military service. Uh, I think at that time they were still doing the draft or something, so he went to the National Naval Medical Center in Bethesda, and he was interested in blood, blood substitutes, blood vessels. Um, and he subsequently reported an article that said there must be a dependence on blood vessels for cancer, so that all cancers are dependent on angiogenesis. And he hypothesized that there's probably some factor that's secreted that makes those blood vessels grow. Now that hadn't been identified, nobody had ever seen one, but that was his hypothesis. So like all brilliant scientists, initially that was not felt to be accurate. That was just the wrong hypothesis. And so his first grant to the National Cancer Institute was rejected. And the reviewer said, it is common knowledge that the hypervascularity associated with tumors is due to dilation of host vessels and not new vessels and that this dilation is probably caused by the side effects of dying tumor cells. Therefore, tumor growth cannot be dependent upon blood vessel growth any more than infection is dependent upon pus. <laughs> well, fortunately, that did not deter Dr. Folkman. And uh, we then now have Avastin. And as I mentioned, that's an inhibitor. Um, it's a humanized monoclonal antibody. It blocks the vascular endothelial growth factor A, or VEGF, and that's a protein that will stimulate the growth of blood vessels. So if you block that, you inhibit blood vessel formation. Um, so that's good if that's in a cancer. That's bad if it's in the heart or other, some other organ. It's given intravenously. It has a very long half-life. And it's the first angiogenesis inhibitor approved in the United States. It was approved in 2004 based on a study that showed an improvement in survival in metastatic colon cancer. Currently, it's approved for use in metastatic colorectal cancer, non-small cell lung cancer, non-squamous, glioblastoma, brain tumor, and metastatic kidney cancer. It looks like it's going to be beneficial in ovary cancer and possibly in hepatocellular cancer. Now in breast cancer, there's some debate, and I don't know if you, any of you have kind of heard about this or not, but there's some discussion as to whether it's beneficial in breast cancer and in metastatic breast cancer. Um, it was first studied in breast cancer in 1997, and there was a study in 2003 that was a negative study, so that kind of slowed research down on that. But then, um, the ECOG study, ECOG 2100, showed a benefit, and based on that, the FDA granted accelerated approval in 2008 for treatment in metastatic breast cancer. And this is the trial. So they took patients who had confirmed metastatic breast cancer, and this had to be their first therapy, um, other than adjuvant therapy. Um, they had to be HER2 receptor negative. Um, and they were randomized to either a drug called Taxol or Paclitaxol plus Avastin or Taxol alone. And the Taxol was given in a low dose weekly format and the Avastin was given intravenously uh, about every two weeks, which is a common um, treatment uh, frequency for that. And that showed a benefit. Now, that's on the left hand, so the progression-free survival on the left curve shows that um, here's survival and then by month. And the top bar is the group with Taxol plus the Avastin. And then the bottom line is the um, Taxol alone. And you can see the curve shifted to the right. 
So there's an improvement in disease-free survival of about six months. Um, but unfortunately, overall survival, there was no difference. So people didn't progress as long, but ultimately they didn't live any longer than people who didn't get the Avastin. But the progression-free data was enough to say that this is something that's potentially valuable, we can start using it. Um, so we did. But since that time, additional studies have not shown as good of a benefit. And no study has shown an overall survival benefit in breast cancer like they did in colon cancer. Um, there's a lot of research going on in this, so there's some other angiogenesis inhibitors, sunitinib and serafinib, that have been studied in breast cancer, but they are not showing as much benefit yet either. So there's some controversy as to whether inhibiting angiogenesis in breast cancer is really effective. Um, and what are some of the problems? Well, any chemotherapy agent has side effects. And uh, I suppose any treatment has side effects. So Avastin has a, a fair number of potential side effects and some which are rather unique. So it can cause hemorrhage from the lung, GI tract, brain, uh, genital urinary area. It can cause blood clots, arterial and venous, bowel perforation, hypertension, proteinuria, lots of different things. So you have to be aware of signs and symptoms of these because they can potentially be severe. And the problem is that they can be fatal. So there is a risk of fatal toxicity with this drug. So that obviously is not what we want to do. This is a meta-analysis that was recently published that looked at all the studies with Avastin in any cancer that were randomized and they pooled all the data together. And basically what it shows is it came out that um, Avastin is associated with higher mortality compared to non-Avastin treatment. Um, I don't think we really understand all that yet, but it can definitely cause mortality. So that was a concern. What else? It's expensive. So it's $10 per milligram. Um, and you get the dosing. Um, it, varies depending on the frequency, but if you do it every two weeks, you give 10 milligram per kilogram intravenously once every two weeks. So if it's a 70 kilogram person, that's $7,000 per treatment. Don't spill it. No. Um, and uh, so if you did long-term treatment, which is kind of what we're talking about in metastatic disease, six months of therapy is about $84,000. A year would be over $100,000, so that's uh, pretty expensive. So last year, there's a committee called the Oncologic Drugs Advisory Committee, and they voted to withdraw approval of Avastin for metastatic breast cancer. Um, so that's just a recommendation to the FDA. The final decision from the FDA is still pending. Um, but they said they would withdraw it, recommend withdrawal because there hasn't been a confirmed uh, data for efficacy. It has potentially severe toxicity. Uh, they're not supposed to take cost into account. Well, that caused a huge uproar in a lot of the um, breast cancer advocacy groups, in a lot of the doctors and scientists and researchers, and that uproar is still kind of going on. Now, the good news is that insurers are still covering the drug, so you can still use it in breast cancer. But Blue Shield of California just recently announced they're going to withdraw coverage, I think, as of next month for uh, metastatic breast cancer. So, um, but right now, Medicare and some of the other insurers will still cover it. Well, in this situation, what do we do? You know, you have some controversy about whether this drug is effective. You have the FDA considering pulling it from the market, which is a fairly unusual thing to do in cancer treatment, to pull a drug that you've approved and that's been, you think, helping people, and now you're going to stop using it. So Dr. Zajewski, she's the director of breast cancer research at the National Cancer Institute, and she oversees all of the cooperative trials in the country. So I asked her what does she think about it. And she says, I think the data show a clear and consistent benefit of Avastin in metastatic breast cancer. The magnitude on average is six weeks, but it might be longer. And the best drug to pair it with is weekly paclitaxel or taxol. 
there is no overall survival advantage, as we talked about. Um, this is Dr. Maura Dickler, and she gave the session on anti-angiogenesis in breast cancer at ASCO meeting this year, and she's from Memorial Sloan Kettering, and her thoughts were that it's likely that angiogenesis is important in breast cancer. We know that activity has been demonstrated in trials, so for sure we know it's active. All patients don't derive the same benefit, and we haven't yet determined the optimal treatment. So we need to do more research, and there's a lot of research going on. One thing that people are saying we might do is look for biomarkers of efficacy. So we know that hypertension is a side effect of this drug, but it turns out people that develop hypertension may have a better response than people who don't. So you can treat the hypertension, you can keep giving the Avastin, and perhaps those patients are the ones that will be a, a group that benefits. We can look for other subgroups. So it turns out that possibly triple negative patients, so negative for estrogen receptor, negative for progesterone, negative for HER2, which is a notoriously difficult group of patients to treat, may do better with an Avastin-based um, therapy. We also need to look at the biology. A lot of the research right now on these new drugs is in metastatic breast cancer. That doesn't necessarily apply to early stage breast cancer, so maybe we need to develop more research looking at early stage treatment rather than late stage treatment. We need to optimize the treatment partner. So there's a lot of talk about a chemotherapy backbone. A lot of these targeted agents, they need some other therapy with them to be effective. So we haven't looked at many chemotherapy backbones for this drug. Paclitaxel seems to be effective. There's a drug called Zolota, that's a pill. Um, that may actually be effective. Some of the other backbones they used in the trials that didn't show a benefit maybe are not the optimal backbone. Um, so there's work being done on that. And then we need to optimize the treatment schedule. We're kind of changing to uh, high dose, as much as you can type of treatment to this what they call metronomic chemotherapy. So we're gonna give chemo frequently, once a week, um, three or four weeks in a row, and repeat that at a lower dose that's not toxic, that doesn't wipe out the bone marrow, that doesn't make people real sick, but it holds that cancer in check and they can live for a longer period of time. Um, and then perhaps we need to block some other pathways. So not just block the angiogenesis pathway, but also block the epidermal growth factor pathway from the HER2, block the endocrine pathway from the estrogen and progesterone. And again, as I said, there's a lot of work being done on those areas, no results on that yet. There's also a thought about rebound. So if you stop some of these treatments, then for some reason the cancer goes wild and it just really gets aggressive. I don't think that's proven yet, but there's some thought about that. So if, you, if that happened, it would negate an overall survival benefit even though you saw a progression-free survival benefit. So people are looking at that a little bit. So in summary, we can't give up because what we know today may not be what we know tomorrow. And uh, I think the answer with the Vastin is that yes, it can be used um, in the appropriate setting that it's approved for now. I don't think it should be withdrawn from the market. I think that healthcare providers are smart enough to look for toxicity and intervene when you start to see some of that um, and use it in the appropriate setting as an option for our breast cancer patients to help them live longer. And as we saw with Donna, eight years of survival with metastatic breast cancer. Not bad, good quality of life, so. Since the lecture last fall, the FDA has revoked approval of Avastin in the treatment of metastatic breast cancer, citing lack of benefit and risk of toxicity. There may be subsets of patients with breast cancer that benefit from Avastin, and studies are ongoing to try and identify those patients.